All right, guys, what we're going to talk about today, um, hopefully draws a connection between cosine and secant, and sine and cosecant, and how we graph them. Um, if I, let's just start with the, let's say on the left-hand side here, I'm just going to graph the sine function. What's the, what, what, is, what function is directly related to the sine function? Okay, so the cosine, so that's, that's a good answer uh, based on how I phrase that. What's the reciprocal of the sine? Cosecant, okay? So let's talk about that relationship, okay? So sine, and I like how you answer that. When I said what, what, what function is directly related to the sine, you can answer that with any five of the other functions and not be wrong, can't you? So my hope is by, and we're not going to dig into this extremely deep uh, in the next couple days or so, but... Ultimately, if you learn the sine function, and you know how it's related to the cosine, you learn the sine function, how it's related to the secant, how it's related to cosecant, how it's related to tangent, how it's related to cotangent. When I ask you to graph these, how many functions do you really need to know how to graph? Just one. If you just know how to graph the sine function, and you know how it's related to the others, you only ever have to know the sine function. Okay. Now, I don't think that that's the... Right now, seeing this for the first time, the most efficient way to do that. Uh, but as you progress through a course, this course, and you maybe um, you know take this further, then eventually maybe that's a route you you go. Okay, um, because it is more efficient once you are comfortable with those relationships. Uh, and that's that's really the purpose of mathematics to develop relationships that allow us to circumvent calculations or circumvent um, more involved processes. So if I graph the sine function over here on the left, okay, um, and obviously we see it there, but I'm going to, um, I'm going to put some points on here. I'm going to put zero, zero on here, okay? So when I put zero, zero on there, what I'm talking about as that point, what those coordinates are is, and this is going to be the true for all of them as we go through this investigation, um, that point right there is zero, zero, which is a theta or a t value, comma, the sine value, right, off the unit circle or the y value off the unit circle, okay? So when I relate that over here on this cosecant function, all the, all the thetas and sines that we see as points over here are going to be the same over here. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, here's my question. If the sine... The sine over here is zero. That's my sine function. Zero over one. Would you guys agree I can do that? And ultimately, it doesn't even, normally, you know, if I have like a number like five, put it over one, it stays five, right? But zero, I could put over any number, correct? So I, we just use one generally, but if you want to go zero over a number, that's still zero, right? What's the reciprocal of that? one over zero or a number over zero, and that's undefined, right? So over on the cosecant, when x is zero, when my input value is zero, I'm actually going to have an undefined value. So we describe undefined values graphically as vertical asymptotes, right? Okay. Now back on the yellow, okay, we know that pi over six comma one half, right? Pi over six comma one half would be that point right there. So over here, we're going to have a pi over 6 again, but now it's the reciprocal of 1 half. What's the reciprocal of 1 half? 2. And we can see that right there. Okay. On the yellow, we're going back to, so now let's go pi over 4, and that would be square root of 2 all over 2, right? Okay. So that's there. That's point D. Over here, it's still pi over 4. But now it's the reciprocal of square root of 2 over 2, which would be 2 divided by square root of 2 in kind of its unsimplified, unra uh, unrationalized format. But it gives me that value there. Okay, there, everybody? Um, the next one's pi over 3, comma, square root of 3 over 2. Oops. Got to be on this curve. Pi over 3, square root 3 over 2. So it gives us point F. Let's come over here. 
and go pi over 3. That would be 2 divided by square root of 3. Gives me point G, right? And over here, the next point is pi over 2, comma 1. What's the reciprocal 1? 1. So pi over 2, comma 1 exists over there. Okay? So these were all increasing, right? What's the reciprocal doing? Decreasing. What are these going to do after they get past H? Decrease. So what are these going to do after they get past I? Increase. Okay? So over here, we're going to have uh, sort of 2 pi over 3, comma, square root of 3 over 2. So then here, it's going to be 2 pi over 3 divided by 2, or comma 2 divided by square root of 3. 3 pi over 4, again, square root of 2 over 2. Then over here, it's going to be 3 pi over 4, 2 divided by square root of 2. My hope is that we're not getting, are, are we understanding what I'm doing here? Taking these y values and reciprocating them to get these? Okay. Uh, then we're going to go 5 pi over 6, comma 1 half, over there. Oh. N needs to be in graphics one. Okay, so it's five pi over six, comma one half. So then on this one, it'd be five pi over six, comma two. And then in this one here, okay, pi, right? Pi again has a y value of 0. So what's the, if the y value is 0 here, what's the reciprocal of 0? Undefined. Really having trouble getting that one there where I want it. All right, so then this would be, on this one, x equals pi will be another asymptote. Is that all right with everybody? Okay, so now on this blue one, what we would basically do is say, well, if I connect those with a smooth curve, so if x is greater than or between 0 and pi right now, let's look at the cosecant function, and we see that they do indeed go through that smooth curve, okay, or create that smooth curve. Now, as we look at this, that point has a y value of 2, right? This point y value of 2, this point y value of 1, those are generally going to be the points that we use as parent function points because this point here, E, it's going to have a Y value. We've got to kind of ballpark it. Remember, it was 2 over uh, root 3. Uh, that's a nasty point to ballpark, nasty point to ballpark. Same thing on those two. So you see the five things that we're going to use? Okay. And a lot of times people will even argue that C and O, those two points, aren't all that necessary. Because if we got the asymptotes, then that, and we got point I there, the asymptotes in that point I are ultimately enough to get the behavior that we're interested in here. Um, now, what if I go over here to this side, okay, this part of the sine function, what are those Y values? What kind of numbers are they? They're negative, right? What's the reciprocal of a negative? Still negative. So what's going to happen when we go over here, and I'm just going to do a couple of these. Uh, let's just do some easy ones. That's 7 pi over 6. At 7 pi over 6, we should be at negative 1 half. Man, struggling. 1 half. We should be at point E, right? So then over here at 7 pi over 6, the reciprocal of negative 1 half is negative 2. Okay. Here at 3 pi over 2, we're at negative 1. Then the reciprocal of negative 1 is negative 1. At 11 pi over 6 on the sine function, we're at negative 1 half. And then that means at 11 pi over 6 on the uh, cosecant, we should be at negative 2. So we get those points. And then at 2 pi, that's an x-intercept, right? So the y value of 0, reciprocal of 0, undefined. So x equals 
2 pi, we have another vertical asymptote. So you see those those blue points being kind of the the pairing or the corresponding of these um, red ones, but they're now negative. If I look at uh, going between zero and two pi for cosecant, you see that those are my curves, right? Does that make sense, everybody? Now let's. And I'm, what I'm going to do here is just demonstrate what we will do. At every single um, time that we're asked to graph a cosecant. First thing I'm going to do is notice that that distance between asymptotes is pi, right? Okay. So let me just put a couple more asymptotes in here real quick. Let's go x equals 3 pi, x equals 4 pi, x equals negative pi, x equals negative 2 pi. Okay, so you got a couple of asymptotes. I'm going to superimpose the sine function on that. Okay, it's going to make it dotted. But the sine function, where where do all those asymptotes occur for the sine function? At at the x-intercepts, right? It's because that's where the y values are always zero. And if I take the reciprocal of a y value that is zero, it gives me an asymptote. It gives me one divided by zero. That's a problem. Okay, so we're going to actually use the sine function to help us graph this, okay? Where do, if I look, if I put on the, the cosecant on top of this, the whole cosecant, where do all of the minimums for the cosecant, okay? So, and they're going to be local minimums, but where do all the local minimums for the cosecant exist? So points like I, I would be a local minimum, right, for the cosecant? Okay, so those, all the local minimums for the cosecant exist at local maximums for the sine, right? And the maximums for the cosecant exist at local minimums for the sine, right? We're going to use those relationships, the relationships that the x-axis or the x-intercepts provide asymptotes, and maximums and minimums become minimums and maximums. Does that make sense? Okay, so show you a quick way of how we're going to sketch a cosecant curve. The one thing you got to realize, again, it's the same period as the sine, okay? But the y values, because we're taking reciprocals, the y values, we don't want to constrain ourselves to y values of 1 and negative 1, right? Okay? Um, so once we get our axes in here, just like before, just like when we graph the sine function, we're going to go out to 2 pi, cut it in half, go to pi, pi over 2, 3 pi over 2. And I'm going to graph, I'm going to, I keep saying superimpose, but it, we're, we're going to use the sine function as a template here. So that, that's going to be part of my graph right now, okay? So you're going to graph the sine function. So sine function we know starts at 0, 0, finishes at 2 pi, 0, crosses at pi, pi or 2 to height of 1, 3 pi or 2 height of negative 1. I'm going to lightly sketch that curve. Okay. Now, we can go, if I wanted to, you might see them request this. If they ever want to go this direction, you can. So then it'd be the same thing, kind of that direction. Is that okay? But once you graph the sine function, if, if my goal is to graph this, the cosecant, I'm now going to go find my x-intercepts. Because my x-intercepts create, ultimately, division by zero on the reciprocal. So I'm going to draw in. That asymptote, that asymptote, that one. And if I need to, we put these over here as well. We put in our asymptotes. Is it okay? Once you find your asymptotes, then you're going to go find the maximums and minimums on the sine function. 
because those are easy to plot, right? And generally, that's enough because we know that we're not going to cross. If I look between these two asymptotes, these first two, there's no way that I'm going to cross this x-axis, okay? So that must mean that when I go to the right, my curve is going to approach the asymptote that way. It's going to approach it that way. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Now, if we want to be a little bit more accurate, we can graph the pi over 6 increments. So here would be pi over 4. So pi over 6 is probably about right there. And at pi over 6, we should be at a height of 2. And then basically, I'm going to take that little purple distance right there and replicate it over here. So at 5 pi over 6, we're also at a height of 2. And now at those three points and my asymptotes, we get that branch of the secant or the cosecant curve. Then over here, so just replace that purple distance again. So I'll give me 7 pi over 6, go down to 2, negative 2, and then replace that purple distance right there. That would be 11 pi over 6, and that gives me down to negative 2. That point right there of 1, negative 1. And now we can sketch that. And we got now one period of our cosecant function. But like I said at the beginning, what was the thing that drove that? What was the thing that we needed to generate that graph? We needed knowledge of the sine function. Okay? So that was the purpose last week, giving that quiz last week to kind of reiterate the need for that thing because it's going to allow us to graph this one. What do you think the cosine is going to do? Cosine is going to give us the secant, okay? And it's the exact same approach, okay? Instead of, just to save a little bit of time here, um, I don't want to go through the cosine function as detailed as we did the sine and cosecant, but let's put the cosine on here, okay? And let's put a point, let's put 0, 1 on there. Okay, if I put 0, 1 on there, what's the reciprocal of 1? 1. So point B is actually going to be get red there. So I'll make the red points here the points that are going to be on. So B is going to be, that's going to be on the, um, secant curve. Okay, so the blue ones are on the, the cosine and the red ones will be on the secant. The y value that is really easy to plot on the cosine is the y value of one half, and that happens at pi over three, right? So on this curve at pi over three, we get one half. What's the reciprocal of one half? Two. So I'm going to plot two, which would be that one there, and we'll make that one red. Okay, so that's a point that's on the secant. That's an x-intercept at pi over 2. Pi over 2 comma 0. Okay, so what is, what's going to exist at that position for the secant? An asymptote. The location of my asymptotes are a little bit different for the cosine function, which should make sense if we understand the relationship between sine and cosine. The sine and cosine are translations of one another 90 degrees, right? Or pi over 2 unit radians. So then the secant and cosecant must have the exact same relationship. Okay, so the, the cosecant had an asymptote at 0. Move it pi over 2 units to the right, and now we get an asymptote for the secant, okay? Um, continuing through here, um, I'm just going to put 2 pi over 3 uh, divided, or comma negative 2, so give me that point F. Um, I'm going to go up pi negative 1. If we go 4 pi over 3, that should be back down to negative 2 as well. And then at 3 pi over 2, what are you going to have at 3 pi over 2? Because of the y value being 0, you're going to get a 
asymptote again, right? And then if I go 5 pi, oh, where did it go? Yeah, 5 pi over 3. Should be up at 2, should be the y value. And then at 2 pi, we're back to 1. So now if I look between 0 and 2 pi and look at the secant function, does that secant function, which is the gray one now, does that curve go through those points that we plotted? And we got those points just by taking the reciprocal of the cosine, right? Okay. Um, and if we look through the whole thing, okay, I'm going to graph the whole cosecant. Oh, wrong one. Graph the whole secant. Is the secant do asymptotes Do all our asymptotes, oh, that formula didn't, pi over, so this asymptote, pi over 2 plus k, oh, pi k, okay, do all these asymptotes, do they exist at x-intercepts for the cosine? Just like previously, right? Okay. If I take um, point B is a maximum of the cosine, it's a minimum of the secant, right? J, maximum of the cosine, minimum of the secant. This point here, maximum of the cosine, minimum of the secant, right? And the same relationship then happens for these maximum minimums down here. So as we graph, the cosine function, that should also give us all the insight we need to graph the secant. So again, by hand, what I'm going to ask you to do, and you're going to have another quiz this week over this. And at that time, on that quiz, we've talked about all six of these. So I could, could ask you to graph all six trig functions. But if I'm going to graph the, our goal here is to graph y equals secant of x. I'm going to graph the cosine first. So we've done that. Okay, so that's the cosine, right? Okay, so then the secant, we attack the secant the exact same way as we did the cosecant. You're going to find your x-intercepts, and those are going to produce asymptotes. Go to 3 pi over 2, another asymptote. Okay, now you're going to go find your maximums and minimums of the cosine, and those become then really the opposite on the secant. So if it was a maximum on the cosine, it becomes a minimum on the secant. If it was a minimum on the cosine, it becomes a maximum on the secant. Um, but now, as I move to the right, I'm going to get closer to that asymptote and approach that asymptote that way. If I go from this point and I go to this at to the left, to that asymptote, I'll approach it that way. And to the right, approach that asymptote. And that is one period of the secant. Yes. Yes. Okay. And that's that's the next relationship that, that we're talking about. If you needed to, if you're like I'm a person like this, like I see, like when we did the secant, or sorry, we did the cosecant, you saw two complete kind. Of, I don't want to call they're not parabolas, but they look parabolic, right? You see these two complete curves. Here you don't. You get half of one, a full one, and then the, another half, right? 
if you're a person that wants to go out to negative pi over 2 here, because you're going to have another asymptote there, and get that full, you can. And then this one here would go out to 5 pi over 2 to get another asymptote. Okay, but if it asks you just to go between 0 and 2 pi, there's no need to do that. But, but it just keeps repeating itself over and over and over again in both directions. Okay? So the question was, see if we can do this easily. Um, if I take sine of x, okay, uh, and let's go cosine of x minus, uh, I'm going to just say a, create a slider. I don't know if I can do this real easily, but I should be able to. Let's go by increments of pi over 12, between 0 and 5. All right, so right now, we've got the red curve being the sine and the blue curve being the cosine, right? Okay. And if I take that blue curve, and basically, as I jump from, and it kind of messed it up, but uh, I'm jumping from pi over 12 increments. Okay, that's what these decimals are here. So eventually, if I go pi over 12 increments six times, it should give me that transformation right there, right? So we see... What this is saying right now is that the, and I, wa I want to run through some relationships here, some uh, essentially identities uh, that are going to allow us to make a little bit more sense, I think, the way that they present it. Uh, but we get the sine of x is now equal to the cosine of x minus, this is pi over Okay, um, so now we know, and then this is where we get, uh, it gets a little bit confusing, um, and my hope is to, to demonstrate this with you, um, the normal traditional way of doing this is to say, okay, well, that means that they are co-functions of one another, they, they are, one, uh, the angle measurement should add to 90. Okay. Well, if I look at, so if I say sine is 30, um, so let, let's leave pi over 2 is 90. If I say sine is 30, then in the cosine, it would be 30 minus 90 would be negative 60, right? 30 and negative 60 are not complementary. They don't add up to 90, right? Does that make sense? So what I want to do, so they'll never present it as that, but that is, that's a very direct relationship that shows us transformation-wise that to get the... Um, sine function from the cosine, you take the cosine, you shift it to the right, pi or two units, right? Okay. But here is my question to you. Do you remember back to um, even an odd properties that said the cosine of negative x was equal to the cosine of x? Remember that? Okay. So what I'm going to do here real quick is I'm going to take this thing right there and just do some finagling with just being creative with my algebra. Can I rewrite this as cosine of negative, negative x plus pi r2? Can I do that? Is that to still say the same thing as this does? All I did is I factored a negative out of this positive and a negative out of this negative, but I left that negative here, right? Now what I want you to see is that that negative right there is that negative right there. Does that make sense? Well, if I can go from here to this, then in this one, I should be able to rewrite it as cosine of negative x plus pi over 2, which is then the same thing as the cosine of pi over 2 minus x by using the commuter property, right? And that is generally the way that you see the sine and cosine relationship as co-function. That makes more sense because now if I say, 
So now we have sine of x is equal to cosine of uh, pi over 2 minus x, or sine of x equals cosine of 90 minus x. Now if I say sine of 30 is equal to cosine of 60, or sorry, 90 minus 30, which is 60. Now that makes sense in regards to the plus or minus aspect, aspects of that 60, right? That makes sense? Okay. That, and, and when, when I was in school, that made uh, really no sense to me because I, I didn't understand the purpose of the algebra that got me from basically saying that cosine of x minus pi over 2 is the same thing as cosine of pi over 2 minus x. Why was that okay to do that? Okay. Because it's not always okay to do that with every function. So what I mean is if we take... So right there we're saying if I type in cosine of x minus pi over 2, graphs that, right? And if I type in cosine of pi over 2 minus x, it's the exact same curve. Agree with that? Okay. What I cannot do is say, okay, that must mean that sine of x minus pi over 2 is the same thing then as the sine of pi over 2 minus x because those are different curves. So per function, it's a little bit different, and it's because of the even-odd relation, the symmetry that exists in these, um, these two functions allows me to make that decision of whether I can do this or not. Um, that being said, you guys remember, and we'll, we'll come back to this here in a moment with the, the sine function um, and the secant and the cosecant, but do you guys remember back into... Um, college algebra, I could tell you that I want, I want you to go through these three points. Those are three x-intercepts. And I asked you to graph or, or just come up with an, an equation or a function that goes through those points. You could write x minus 5 times x minus 9, um, I guess it's the first three, uh, and x minus 1. If I look at these three, these are the x-intercepts, right? Okay, so look at these first three. And I asked you, can you go ahead and create the equation that goes through those, the function that goes through those three points? Okay. And we did that. But if I give you this fourth point, you can see as that fourth point, do, the, do all these functions go through A, B, and C? But once I give you a fourth point, now it dictates what these coefficients have to be, and that's the one function that passes through all four, right? So in college algebra, if I said, here are the four points that I want you to use and write a function on, everybody's getting the same function. Does that make sense? But if I do that same thing in trig, if I ask you, come up with, you know, the equation for that graph right there. If I hide the cosine of it and I just say, come up with the equation for that, Every one of you could come up with something completely different that is right because of these relationships. Because you could say, oh, well, I'm going to write that as um, cosine of x plus 2 pi. Because that's the same thing, right? Okay. Some of you might say, oh, it's the sine of pi over 2 minus x. And it gives me the same thing. Okay. But the na your neighbor might say, no, it's the sine of pi over 2 minus x plus 2 pi. That makes more sense to me. But all of those are exactly the same curve, correct? Okay. To alleviate that, there'll be instructions that say, hey, make sure you write it in terms of sine. So you only use the sine function. And then we'll say, with the smallest possible phase shift or something like that. So there's ways to get us down to one. But these are all equivalent. And it's because... The sine and cosine are transformations of one another. So I can always write the other one in terms of the other one, okay, uh, if I apply the right transformation. <clears throat> so the question that Sam asked earlier was, if, if, if the secant and cosecant, do they have the same relationship? If that's... Come on. If I have the secant of x looks like that and the cosecant of x looks like that, 
Okay. Can we take one of them and move it to the right or to the left and it become the other one? Okay. Well, if I go secant, so that's the purple one, how far would I have to move the purple point right there to become that point right there? Pi or two. And it move pi or two to the right, correct? And it becomes that one. Okay. Or could we take the gray one and move it pi over to to the left pi over two to ah uh, let's put an extra parenthesis in there that I don't want plus pi over two there we go and that becomes the purple one right so yes, that, that relationship does exist. And that's what we were saying at the beginning. If I know the sine function and how that creates the cosine or how it relates to the cosine, and I know that the sine, how I can get the sine to create the cosecant, and then how the sine and cosine relate. So the sine and the cosine relate by a shift of pi over two units. Then the secant and cosecant should be related the same way, right? Shift of pi over two units. So it all goes back to us being able to know what does the sine function look like and then these little added relationships can help us develop the other functions. I don't think that's initially the first time we've ever talked about these. The best way to learn how to graph the secant is to know those relationships. Um, but they are built in, or we can, we can investigate them uh, and analyze them in that, that manner if we want to. If we take... So we talked about the sine function and the cosine function, okay? Now, the sine function, okay, if I want that to become the cosine, okay, so here's your sine function, and your cosine starts this way. How do I get the sine function, how do I get that point to go to that point? How far is that distance, pi or two. So I'm gonna take the sine function, and I'm gonna move it left, pi over two, and that should give me my cosine, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Now I can also do it this way. I could take the cosine, okay, the cosine function, which is this one, and I can move it to the right pi over two, right? And that will give me sine of x, okay? But generally, these things are never written. When we look at the relationship that they are co-functions, they are never written with the x first. It's always pi over 2 or 90 first, okay? So what I want to do here, obviously, we could use the commutative property and just write this as pi over 2 plus x, okay? But when I write it as pi over 2 plus x, the complementary idea doesn't necessarily present itself, okay? So what I want to do here is write this as um, if there's a transformation that exists, and what time we get at? 51? Actually, let's, because I don't think we're going to get through this whole thing. Let's pick up there tomorrow. Okay, so I'll leave this alone. We'll pick up there tomorrow. Um, my, my, my hope for you, because I, I think it's very, very important, is to see the relationships that are presented in a text, how they are, how they come about them, okay? Because we can see them transformation-wise, that one function becomes the other by a shift to the right or left of pi over two. But when they present it in the text, it's, it, the argument's kind of backwards, okay? But I want you to see why it's that way, okay? Uh, and it has to do with the even-odd properties that we talked about last week or two weeks ago, um, coupled with the transformations that are going on. Is it okay? And they write it the way they do so that you can see the complementary relationship between a sine and a cosine or a secant and a cosecant or a tangent and a cotangent. So we'll pick up with that tomorrow. 
Um, later in the week at some point, maybe Wednesday at the earliest, um, we'll give you 10, 15 minutes to work on a, a short graphing quiz um, on paper, and it could be any of the six functions that we've talked about, okay? We'll show this relationship tomorrow, and then after that, we'll get into, okay, well, how do I graph one-half secant of 2x minus pi over 6, okay? Um, and that should be an, an easy transition from what we've already done. Uh, so that's the plan as we move forward this week. Have a great one.